Hi, thank you for joining us tonight here over on Zoom. Uh, my name is Catherine, and I'll be your host tonight for this PALS event. You can check out our upcoming list of events over at pals.com slash events. You can also follow us on all forms of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now TikTok, because what better way to continue a pandemic than learn how to TikTok? Uh, tonight, we're excited to welcome Ju local Portland author Juhei Kim to the virtual PAL stage. Uh, Juhei Kim's writing has been featured in Grant, wait, sorry, Granta, Catapult, Joyland, and elsewhere. She's the founder and editor of Peaceful Dumpling, an online magazine at the intersection of a sustainable lifestyle and ecological literature. After a decade in New York City, Kim now lives with her two rescue cats in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I just saw them brought around the screen. They are very cute, but I hope they come back because we, we're here at Pals. We love cats. Uh, Juhei is here to discuss her debut novel, which came out today. Happy book birthday, uh, Beast of a Little Lamb. In 1917, deep in the snowy mountains of occupied Korea, an impoverished local hunter on the brink of starvation saves a young Japanese officer from an attacking tiger. In an instant, their fates are connected. And from this encounter unfolds a saga that spans half a century. Immersive and elegant, Beast of a Little Lamb unveils a world where friends become enemies, enemies become saviors, heroes are persecuted, and beasts take many shapes. Uh, and if you order from us, we'll mention it in the chat as well, but Juhei was lucky enough to sign so many copies for us. So, and they also make a great gift because the holidays are coming up. And if you, um, when I share the link in the pro, share the link in the chat, once you click on it, you'll be getting a signed edition, which is really wonderful. Uh, she'll be joined in conversation by fellow author, Caroline Kim. Caroline is the author of a collection of short stories tied up the Prince of Mournful Thoughts and other stories which won the 2020 Drew Hines Prize in Literature, was nominated for a Northern California Book Award, and was long listed for the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize and the Story Prize. Uh, tonight's event will include a Q&A, so make sure to ask your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen, uh, the Q&A box, instead of the chat box, so that way Caroline can make sure we keep them all in one place. Uh, if someone does ask a question that you especially would like to know the answer to, you can give that question a like for better visibility. Uh, please consider supporting Juhei and Pals by purchasing a copy of her book from us. Uh, like I said, I'll be sharing a link in the chat and all the books will be signed. And now I want to thank Juhei and Caroline for joining us this evening for what will be an enlightening discussion. We are so grateful to have you both here. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you so much. Juhei, I'm so excited to talk with you today. And first of all, I have to congratulate you. Today is your book's birthday. How does that feel? <laughs> Um, like a huge weight has been lifted from my chest. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge accomplishment. You have to celebrate. Thank you. Um, hopefully I'll celebrate after this. <laughs> I'm sure you, you, I'm sure you're exhausted already. Um, well, first I want to start out by telling you how much I loved reading your, your book. Um, it was like 10 to 15 years ago, I was looking for a book just like yours. And I would have been so happy if you had been around then. Um, because I was really looking for a book set in historical Korea, but I don't know how to read in Korean. So I was looking around and really there just wasn't anything. Um, and it seems like things are starting to change now, which is really exciting. And there are even more and more books being translated, um, Korean books being translated into English, which is really exciting. But uh, it seems like a lot of them fall into uh, what I would call speculative fiction. And maybe this is because, you know, publishers think this is what translates more easily to a non-Korean culture. Um, but for Korean American, uh, for Korean Americans, I think a book like this is really, really exciting. And one of the things I love most about your novel is kind of like how big and sweeping and kind of old fashioned it is. Um, and maybe because I'm a short story writer myself, but I love, love, love big sweeping novels. And, you know, this one just, you hold a lot of different stories. There's multiple characters. There's, you know, it spans quite a long time. It starts from 1917 and goes to 1965. Um, so just wanted to start by asking you, how did the novel come to you? Did you start with one of the main characters? Was it Jade or, or was the setting in Korea? What attracted you to the story? 
So um, this is gonna sound a little bit unbelievable, but the, how the story came to me, it came to me um, almost whole. And I'm not saying that it didn't change because it went through extensive revision process over um, you know, quite a bit of time. I wrote the book over two years and I revised it for mm -hmm. two years. But there were um, certain anchor scenes that came um, like that, uh, almost right at the beginning. So um, I started working with my agent in November 2015, almost exactly six years ago. And at the time, um, I was just beginning to get my footing as a writer. I hadn't dared to consider myself seriously as a talent, but I was overjoyed that um, my agent Jody Khan agreed to represent me. And um, she had asked me to write some short stories and um, she said, okay, you're pretty good. I, I wanna represent you. And I thought, okay, when can we sell my short story collection, Caroline? <laughs> you know, as a short story collection, short story writer, how hard it is to sell a collection. So my agent told me exactly that. And she said, why don't you go write a juicy novel that I can actually sell and then we can talk. Mm -hmm. So. I went running in Fort Tryon Park in um, Manhattan in the snow. And I was just like, oh, what am I doing with my life? I'm in my late 20s. I haven't published a book. My friends are more successful than I am. What do I do? And it was during a blizzard. And um, as I was running in the snow, I came up with the opening scene, the prologue. It kind of um, came to me almost whole. Wow. And another scene um, where these two lovers that have been lovers slash friends, now you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. uh, those two lovers slash friends who have been separated for years, they reunite. Um, it's kind of a penultimate chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, that also came to me um, very, very quickly, like during this run. So I had a lot of anchor scenes that I knew um, would make it into the final novel. And um, those were the scenes that um, uh, I wrote all in one go. And during the extensive revision process, they did not change almost at all. The prologue, the version in the final book is almost the entire thing that I wrote um, at the very beginning, which is uh, <laughs> quite unusual. Very. Um, so that's how I came up with it. And, the, the cast of characters, what happens to them, um, most of it uh, came very quickly and um, I just knew the overall arc of the story where it needed to go. Mm -hmm. Like the smaller details of um, what happens when or like, you know, um, do I tell this in scene or more like summarize, mm -hmm. those kinds of details did change a lot. but. What happens to them generally um, stayed the same the entire time. Wow, I'm really amazed by that. I have to say. <laughs> um, so I have to ask some follow-up questions about that. <laughs> so, I, what kinds of things had you been writing before that? You said you were writing short stories. Were some oh, of the, some of this in the <laughs> stories you were writing? So uh, you know, um, my. My literary debut was a short story called Body Language in Granta, which um, for American readers, uh, which most of us are here, uh, Granta is like the most prestigious literary journal in the UK. Um, and uh, to write that body language story, um, before then I had never written anything seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working as an editorial, editorial assistant at a New York publisher um, from 2011 to 2014. And then I had quit that job and um, I was actually kind of doing freelance and making my meager ends meet. Um, and uh, I just came up with the story um, that also kind of flew into my head. And uh, I, I wrote that story in a weekend um, in Chicago. And um, I was so proud of myself. I thought this was this was something good. And I had only been on the editorial side. I had never dared to think that I could actually write on my own. But mm -hmm. on the flight back to New York, I opened my laptop to congratulate myself on job well done. And I realized all 6,000 words had been erased. <sighs> and I was devastated. I was like, this means I should not be a writer. And I remember landing in LaGuardia 
also during snow, a dirty snow time in New York. And it, this was past midnight and I didn't have enough money to take a cab. So I took multiple buses to get to my apartment in Harlem. And during that time, during that bus ride over the bridge going into Manhattan, I said, you know what? I'm going to go home and I'm going to rewrite the whole thing from scratch, from memory. So that whole night I get home, it's like past 1 a.m. and I'm exhausted and I'm like, typing like a mad woman from memory. And then I got that finished at 7 a.m. the next morning. And that um, that short story um, I said to uh, Gail Hockman, who is quite a well-known literary agent in New York that I knew from my days being an editorial assistant. And she said, uh, this is pretty good. I'm not taking new clients, but maybe one of my junior people might. And so, she forwarded that to Jody. Jody read it and she was like, you're pretty good. Um, do you want to send me a bunch more short stories? So I started writing on demand. I was like, I have to get an agent. So I wrote a bunch more short stories. Um, and then she told me to go write a novel. So the, um, the end result was that those short stories didn't go to waste because I got published in Granta and we use that for a lot of things. I got published in other places using that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, actually, um, those short stories that I wrote on demand for Jody in 2015, like even one of them is being published this spring um, called Cockroach, which is one of my favorite short stories I've ever written. Mm -hmm. So um, nothing you ever do as a writer goes to waste. Uh, you kind of have to understand just because you wrote a story one day doesn't mean it's it, if it doesn't get published the next month, it's over. If you hold on to it for long enough, somebody's going to want it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> that's true that's true wow th that is really an amazing story and um kind of kills me a little bit <laughs> it takes me like years to write a story so um but I'm very impressed with you that you actually being that exhausted were able to write it again well strike uh, like when the iron is hot and also I'm very Korean and Korean to Korean you understand that we're very passionate people super fiery and I like to get things done fast and that's actually my one of my strengths and shortcomings as a writer. I think your strengths and weaknesses are off, often two sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So while I never suffer from a writer's block, I may uh, write too quickly. So now I have to go back and fix it. And I don't enjoy revision at all. I'm definitely um, a kind of an inspired muse mm -hmm. type of writer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not. I'm not surprised to hear that you're. You take your time because I can feel it. Um, I think you and I probably have a lot of differences that that's probably why I admire your writing so much because um, there's something in there that I, I don't have. So <laughs> well, I this, definitely feel the same by with the you. Way, this, by the uh, way, is Caroline's book. I just want to point that out that oh, I love so you. much. Thank you. Um, so going back to you were so you were working as an editorial assistant. Were you not really interested in writing at the time? Like you thought you would be an editor? Well, yeah, <laughs> Interesting. because, um, you know, uh, many of you in the audience know um, that I grew up in Portland and um, I didn't grow up uh, very um, wealthy, uh, even though I did go to a private school here. Um, I went to a Catholic school here in Beaverton, Oregon. Um, my family definitely um, didn't have like a ton of money. And I, by, by, um, by chance, and, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Princeton, which is a very well-regarded school and also has an amazing creative writing program, mm -hmm. um, which was at one point helmed by the late, great Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, when I was there, I didn't think that I could have, um, a professional artist career. I didn't think that was available to me. The thought would not have entered my head. And that's something that a lot of immigrants and um, working class um, students don't have. People who at that age are confident enough to say, I'm gonna become a writer. And when you're 18 or 19, they have to have some sort of background to um, enable them to feel that way. And I de definitely did not have that confidence. I started art history because I thought, that's something that's a little more solid. I can get a job at a museum. Mm -hmm. And um, 
from there, um, I, I went through a little bit of a circuitous path to publishing, but being an editorial assistant is also um, something that feels a lo lot more stable, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was my path to writing, but certainly I don't think any experience is wasted. Everything just helps yeah. you become a better person and better artist. Definitely, definitely. So you, so you didn't really take any creative writing classes when you were at Princeton? <laughs> You know, I, if I could go back in time, like I would love to, because that, that was such an opportunity, right? But um, I learned how to write through art history and art history was actually, to me, the number one blessing. Um, it taught me everything I needed to know. And um, I am I say this to everybody, but my favorite um, class at Princeton was a seminar on ornamental art by a, a professor named Professor Robert Bagley. And this was like an earth shattering moment for me. We were studying rose windows of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, rose windows are concentric circles, um, stained glass, and uh, they're pretty difficult to describe. Um, but, you know, we were tasked with describing this in a paper and analyzing it and um, giving it um, the artist, art historical treatment. And I wrote a paper that I thought was like bang on. I was like, this is gonna be a great, a paper and it came back to me with a lot of red marks and Professor Bagley said, Juhei, with something like this, you need to make a decision. You have two choices. You have to decide if you're gonna start from the center and go out or go from the outside and go in. Hmm. And it was like, oh my gosh, a light bulb went off um, because with art history, it's really all about describing something so precisely that you can lead the, the reader through mm -hmm. any situation, through mm -hmm. to what you're seeing. And I'm a visual writer. When I think, thing, think things, I see scenes. Mm -hmm. So um, I realized it's not about describing something in a way that's never been done before, which I think MFAs and English um, majors tend to kind of view writing. And you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, it's a crowded field. If everybody's trying to just come up with new poetic ways to describe something, you're, you're often gonna be discouraged. Whereas um, my philosophy has always been, what are you trying to say and what's the most accurate and precise way of saying it? Because that's how an art historian, art historian would write. Ah, oh, that's fascinating. That's really such great advice. Um. Are, aren't you blown away? That's brilliant, <laughs> Rose window. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's such a concise way to think about it, too. Um, yeah, I was so impressed reading your book, how the clarity in it. Um, I, you know, hearing you say that you see it visually makes a lot of sense because that's the way I, I you know, I felt it. And I, you know, it was such an kind of engrossing, immersive experience. Um, and I love that I hadn't read a book like that where I'd really kind of like, you know, got really pulled into the story. It's been a while since I read a, a novel like that. Um, so I just really kind of love that kind of surrender to it. And but but as a Korean American writer in the background, you know, having, you know, tried to write my own story set in Korea, I was like, oh my God, how did she do this? Like, where did she learn all this stuff? You know, and um, so you're you're bilingual and you've even translated. Um, like a short story, right, from Korean into English. So you're obviously pretty comfortable with the Korean language. But I was wondering, where did you get your, did you read like books, like history books written in Korean? Did you watch movies, like K-dramas, listen to music? What, how did you go about the research? So I will say I don't watch a lot of K-drama or, you know, if any, like I, I watch very little visual medium, although I did, I did recently watch Squid Game. I mean, I couldn't, it was a global phenomenon. <laughs> um, but uh, my, my biggest source was definitely history books and also literature from that time because um, mm -hmm. early 1900s in Korea was like Harlem Renaissance in the U.S. Mm -hmm. There's something about oppression that really makes people want to um, create art because art is a form of resistance mm -hmm. and they were doing the same thing. And um, it was really inspiring. Uh, what I learned from reading the short stories and novels from that time mm -hmm. is really that um, humans are the same everywhere. They're under colonial power. There's war, 
um, everywhere, violence, oppression, and hunger. Mm -hmm. What do people really think about? Um, they're really thinking, what am I going to eat for dinner? Um, does this person like me? Am I still hot and young? I, I, the problems that people are thinking about are really the same. You know, they're worried about looking cool in front of their friends or um, making enough money, finding a job. Mm -hmm. So um, it was really refreshing to know and uh, reassuring to know that I don't have to think, what does an tw early 20th century Korean person think? What does a human being think? Just mm -hmm. focus on what a human being wants. Mm -hmm. and that made it pretty easy. -er. <laughs> But you had, learn, I mean, I felt like I learned so much. I don't know if this, some of this was, th were things that you made up or you found, but then those cafes, the separate cafes that people would go to, like, if you were, uh, you know, if you were an artist, you would go to this cafe. If you were, you know, so, a communist, you would favor another cafe. So I will say a lot of it's based in history. A lot of it's also fiction. For example, the cafe culture was a real thing. People went to this, these dance halls. The, the whole ballroom dancing thing, it was all the rage. Um, you weren't really supposed to dance, so it was kind of a secret, just like the Prohibition era. Um, but uh, people loved jazz. Jazz was a big thing back then. Um, uh, and so a lot of that is based in reality. Um, the record culture, the SP record before the LPs came out, and um, they were real celebrities, just like the Beatles or, you know, K-pop stars. They were um, glamorous. Uh, they had their pictures taken in magazines. So all those things are rooted in history. But um, as far as are these the exact cafes, um, that depends. A, a lot of the cafe names I made up, but some of them, some of the restaurants, they still exist. So they're kind of they're kind of both. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think that that's fine. Um, I don't think you have to be afraid that, um, you know, if I say something and it, it never existed, it's wrong. Well, that's why it's literature. That's why it's fiction. Right, right. And it rings true, which is what, what's most important. <laughs> um, but I, I was also wondering, it's this, it felt what, you know, the book, it felt very Korean to me, which I loved. And you know, that's really not easy to do when you're writing in English. Um, so I wanted to kind of like, did you, did you have challenges with it? What were the challenges? And, you know, what were some of the, yeah, go ahead. That to me felt really easy. Again, I, I'll, I'll ask me later what was hard. Okay. Cause I will have the hard ones, but, um, <laughs> You know, I'm a huge fan of world literature, and uh, one of my biggest inspirations is the Russian greats. I love Tolstoy, I love mm -hmm. Bulgakov, I love um, these masters. And uh, something the something that has taught me is that it doesn't matter if you're reading this in Russian or English. Mm -hmm. If you write it well, it will translate. I'm reading all of them in English, but that doesn't diminish my appreciation mm -hmm. um, because it's universal. It's literature, so. Um, when I wrote in English, I had no fear that just because I'm writing English that this isn't gonna translate. Um, I will say sometimes I will come up with scenes and dialogue in English or in Korean in my head, but it will come out in English. So um, later when we read, um, there will be a chapter, chapter five opening is one of the, my favorites and I will read from that later. But it's a chapter about this bourgeois man. He's a publisher. He's uh, he's uh, Tokyo educated. He's Korean, and he's kind of full of himself. And then um, he settles down for his morning at the publishing house. And his friend from Shanghai, who's a revolutionary, uh, comes to see him. And um, in that scene, they greet each other, saying, "How long has it been? How long?" And really, in English, people don't greet each other that way. It's Korean. That's how people greet each other in Korean. So I thought of that in Korean. I wrote it in English. But you know what? I don't think that that's awkward just because he's not saying, hey, how are you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice to see you again, which is how people would greet each other in English, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, so uh, I think just <laughs> write what feels natural. People, people kind of go along with it, I think. <laughs> How did you come to, when you were thinking about the characters, and you said some of them came to you immediately, right? Um, 
you know, did you, how did you, you know, come, how did Jade become, um, how was she, how did you think about her as a courtesan? Like, how did that come to you? Um, so I, I have to say this, um, there's, there was even a chip on my shoulder from choosing a courtesan as a topic of my big epic debut novel. And um, I think writers of color, um, Asian authors might really understand what I'm talking about. There's this huge penalty that you have when um, writing about these women. And, um, and it is even worse than Western courtesans. And um, for example, uh, La Traviata, Lady of, Lady of Camellias um, uh, is one of the best known opera ballet slash books uh, in the English can or uh, in the Western canon. It's about a courtesan uh, uh, inspired by a real life courtesan, Marie du Plessis, who lived in France in the 19th century, but it, it became the inspiration for this big opera ballet book combination. Many movies have been made, but no one bats an eye. No one thinks that that's seedy or lascivious or overly sensuous. It's just considered great work of art. Whereas if it's um, a Korean courtesan, it immediately falls into, well, that's a very um, unctuous Asian historical fiction, like something wrong with it, but there isn't. Um, courtesans were actually a vital part of society at the time. Um, they were, they have played a role as women artists for centuries in Korea. Mm -hmm. And honestly, according to our modern way of thinking, they were really liberated for their time. They made their own money. They didn't answer to one man. They had many lovers um, and uh, they had a lot of independence and yeah. that made them very attractive to me. And also the fact that they were such accomplished artists. They um, were thinkers. They, they were actually intellectuals because um, they uh, were part of a lot of uh, movements. They had their own magazines. Um, so uh, I think that um, there was a great um, fear of me choosing that as uh, my main protagonist, but also um, a kind of uh, defiance. Like I wanted to try it. I wanted to show that it can be done well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it makes sense too, because not a lot of Korean women at that time had freedom of movement. So she had, I mean, she got probably got more education than most women did. And she was able to move around more. Mm -hmm. I think right. that independence is really, really important. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, Inyan, the Korean kind of, I love the way you describe it in the book, like human thread. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that runs throughout the novel? So um, Inyan, I actually looked up the Chinese characters. It's mm -hmm. not actually thread. Okay, so inyan sounds like human, in, yun, thread, but the yun part is actually not thread, but we talk of it as though it's something that you can cut off, right? So it, it has that visual image of like that actual physical connection. Um, but, it, you know, this is the, uh, um, inyan plays a role in this book because it's the worldview of Koreans. Um, these these people's, these characters' lives are entwined, not because I'm trying to force them so I can get my plot together, but it's also because it's reflective of the worldview that Koreans have, mm -hmm. which is that we have this preordained destiny connection, spiritual connection between people. And I think you know, Caroline, that uh, we believe that that exists between parent and child. Mm -hmm. We have that between spouses, um, we have that between enemies and friends. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a uh, Korean saying that's um, actually in the book, and it it goes even brushing the hem of one's coats in the streets is inyan. Mm -hmm. That means even something that's very light acquaintance that had to take maybe hundreds or thousands of years for you guys to be at that spot so that you can meet. And so I don't think Koreans take um, anything for granted. And that's definitely the worldview that inspired this novel. And I'm, I, I kind of feel that the form, um, the, that entwined cathedral-like form um, is reflective of the substance, mm -hmm. um, the, the values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I really loved about what you said too, about the connection, not just between 
people who do love each other, but even between enemies, that there is a, a clear, clear connection. And that's definitely, I mean, you know, from the, what happens in the prologue, and you see those, what, you know, what follows from that later to the very end. Um, it was such a great example of that, kind of a great manifestation of that. Um, when you were writing this, were you, were you, were there any like Korean American writers you were reading or who are influencing you or, or just other writers in general? So um, I would say I, 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 the particular, this particular book isn't inspired by any, um, any specific Asian writers. Uh, this is more, like I said, the Russian greats mm -hmm. and um, that, that was really what I was interested in. Um, hold on, I just need to, okay, there we go. I just disabled the, um, the oh, evening no. time mode. Um, but uh, other than that, I am really interested in um, Korean authors um, because I think a lot of American literature that comes out now is solipsistic. Um, it tends to deal a lot with uh, oneself and not much beyond that. And I've always been interested in literature that's a little bit more outward looking and, um, and with a, a little bit more empathy. And that's quite old fashioned, but that's also the prevailing mode outside of the US I find. And um, of course, um, you know, Korean literature is not a monolith, but there is that such strong tradition of socially conscious literature in Korea. And that suits my sensibilities very much. One of the Korean authors that I really admire is um, Choi In-ho. Um, and he passed away in 2015. He's one of 20th century's greatest uh, Korean authors. Um, and I had the privilege of translating him and getting him published at Granta through my editor there. Wonderful. And, um, we, Caroline, you and I spoke about uh, Kim Eran. Mm -hmm. And she has been published ex extensively into English. Um, her novel, My Brilliant Life, mm -hmm. uh, came out in, in, in America not too long ago. And um, I encountered her short stories um, a while back, translated into English. And I thought that she's just such a phenomenal talent and very different from me. Um, very different because I'm such a full-blooded writer. Um, there's... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very earnest. I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of irony and that's reflective of my personality, but this book is a very earnest and straightforward, passionate book. And um, I think Kim Aran is doing something totally different, which I always admire. Um, it's kind of looking at things from all sorts of different ways as opposed to just straight on. And um, I found that really refreshing and something that I can learn from. I, I admire your writing for the same reason. I think that there's a, a really beautiful ethereal um, quality to your writing that I just so admired from The Prince of Mournful Thoughts. Um, and uh, other books, um, I'm gonna just add one more here. And I think this is important. Um, uh, one of the my favorite finds in the past one year has been this novella by a Japanese author named uh, Fukusawa Shichiro, mm -hmm. named um, uh, Narayama Bushiko. Uh, this is going to be very hard. So the PALS um, employees who are going to be <laughs> entering this, these books, uh, they're going to have a little bit of a hard time. This is actually considered uh, one of 20th century Japanese literature's gems. I don't know how well known it is outside. Mm -hmm. certainly has been translated into Korean, which is the language in which I read it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, the fact that I have the audacity to write in Japanese characters who don't play such a positive role in my book um, is because I was sincere in wanting to know more about Japanese culture and the Japanese mind. Mm -hmm. So I was reading some, some Japanese works. And um, this one, is so Japanese and it's mind-blowingly good. It's one of the fav one of my favorite short stories slash novellas I have ever read. It, mm. It's kind of a perfection um, in, in that form. Mm. And what I loved about that, that's very life and art affirming because true art really transcends borders and any type of ideology or nationality. I, 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 I knew only a Japanese author could have written that. 
Mm. And I admired it so much. So those are some of the Asian ones. And yeah, we should probably move on because I could talk about this for a while. That's wonderful. Is, has that been translated into English? Do you know? Oh, man, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, it's a great question. Um, Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to google it but um i see in the chat box like can you write that down please it it's called let we'll we'll go back there and we'll do it later but it's called narayama bushiko probably exactly how you hear it narayama bushiko okay <laughs> um so i wanted to ask you in writing this I mean, this was probably the first novel you really attempted to write, right? Oh, yeah. um, what you found, what was the hardest, what was what came easily, what was hard, and was there anything that really surprised you during this process? Oh yeah, um, I think we talked enough about what came easily. What came easily was like the plot and like the characters just kind of jumped at me and all these elements. I am a very intuitive writer. I think I'm an intuitive person in general, but like, um, Sometimes I, I would know what would happen next and I would sleep on it. And in my dreams, I would figure out what would happen. And then I'd just write that in. Um, there was definitely one dream that I actually dreamed and then made it into the book. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, but so that's the easy part. The hard part was the revision. And I, uh, you know, there are two camps because writers either love writing the first time or they love editing. And I'm definitely the drafter. I, I hate revising. Um, maybe because I rely so much on this lightning bolt of inspiration just as a human being, and I don't want to mess that up. But let me tell you, that's a real weakness. I'm not bragging about it because you need to really learn to sit down and revise no matter how much you don't want to. And um, I did force myself to revise as many times as it took to get it up to shape because I think um, it's a very rare writer who can write 400 plus page novel all from ins inspiration. Some of that's gonna have to be a lot of whiteouts do over. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so I wanna leave enough time for you to give us a little reading <laughs> before we turn to the audience Q&A. So you would love to do that now. All right. So um, I will read from chapter five because uh, I would normally read from the prologue, but that's go going to be um, excerpted by Shenandoah, a literary journal that's coming out in a couple more days. So um, I'll do this one that was excerpted today on LitHub. The Friend from Shanghai, 1918. Every human being fundamentally believes in his or her unique and inherent significance without which life would be unbearable. But in Kim Song Soo's psyche, that belief was not merely a foundation, but the piece de resistance. He himself was not conscious of that fact, of course, since such people are precisely the least likely to admit to selfishness. Being a well-educated, modern man, he had his own code of conduct and was sufficiently pleased with himself for meeting it without too many difficulties. That is to say, he was pro-independence, but against any form of native activism. Change could only come down top down through imploring the United States to free Korea, he believed. Among friends, he would say aptly vitriolic, vitriolic comments about the oppression, enjoying the eloquence of his own speech and the smooth taste of his Japanese cigarettes. He could carry on love affairs that were physically, financially, and sometimes even emotionally involving but he wouldn't be so base as to flaunt them in front of his wife, subjecting her to needless humiliation. In short, his moral character was no worse than any other Korean male who is born the only son of a prominent landowning family with an annual income of nearly 200,000 won. When Kim sang soo was young, his father was known around the entire province simply as Rich Man Kim, and he himself was called Little Master not only by their own servants, but also by peasants for miles around it and, and in neighboring villages. Like all sons of wealthy landlords, he was sent away to Seoul for high school, followed by university. He was betrothed and married at 20 to an official's daughter who had only recently graduated from a Christian women's college. They lived together for almost three years in the five-room guest house at his uncle's mansion 
across the courtyard from the main building. Tong Su spent those days mingling with his friends, all young men of wealth and education and carousing with courtesans at expensive restaurants. At night, he came home senselessly inebriated to his wife and let her undress him and gently admonish him. She'd been educated by American missionaries at school, but at home, she'd also been taught that an ideal wife embraces her husband's flaws with patience and self-sacrifice. But Kim Sung soos uncle, a government official who would eventually become a count in the wake of the annexation in 1910, determined that his nephew couldn't go on wasting away family fortune and his own talent and had him sent to Japan for further studies. Song Su left his wife at home and arrived in Tokyo alone and spent the next three years half-heartedly studying French, German, and Russian literature. When he wasn't reading Pushkin or Goethe, he was in the company of other expert students, many of whom were as carefree as he was. The others who were earnest and occupied with political theories, sovereignty, and equality, he avoided without even being conscious of it. One was too tiresome, another was truculent, and still another was unsophisticated and had no appreciation for culture. Yet, Song Su had unexpectedly become close with the student of the political circle, as one sometimes picks out and strikes up a friendship with only a single person out of a group that he otherwise scorns. This student had impressed Song Su with his uncommon intelligence, illustrious family background, and something that helps sort their relationship time and again, genuine humility. Such was the history between Kim Sung Soo and his old friend Lee Myung Bo. After Sung Soo returned to Seoul, Myung Bo stayed in Tokyo for another year. He then moved on to Vladivostok, continued westward across Manchuria, and settled semi permanently in Shanghai. Sung Soo had lost touch with his friend six or seven years previously and had not thought of him even in his private unspoken thoughts for so long that it jolted him when out of the blue, he received a letter from Youngbo asking him to meet. After the initial surprise, however, Song Su regained his composure and warmed himself to the idea of re reuniting with his friend until he became genuinely excited. On the appointed day, Song Su woke up and washed his face with hot water made ready for him by the old woman who served the family as a housekeeper. He shaved carefully, then put on a crisp white shirt that his wife had ironed and laid out for him. The smartly creased sleeves cracked open as he pushed his arms through them, a distinct sensation that he greatly enjoyed. When he was fully dressed, his wife appeared with his breakfast, consisting of a bowl of white rice, fried fish, soybean sprout soup, kimchi, and steamed eggs with fermented shrimp. Did you sleep well? She asked in a friendly voice as she laid down the tray. He grunted in reply. She chattered about their son, who had again gotten himself in some sort of trouble at school and their infant daughter, who she su suspected might have contracted the chicken pox. To all of these domestic issues, Song Su paid only the slightest attention. It often felt to him as though his children belonged more to his wife than to himself. He was disappointed by how little affection he naturally had for them and suspected that his attitude toward them was an extension of how he felt about his wife, their mother. The other three got along imperfectly but with perfectly natural, warm, and even passionate attachment to one another. It was as if Song Su had been dropped into a picture of an actual, real family lacking just a father figure. He often felt as though he were play acting with someone else's wife and children. Uh, that's all great, Song Su replied, only half aware that his wife was talking about their daughter's rash. I better get going. It was one of those October mornings when the sky is brilliantly blue and the air is wonderfully fresh. From the roofs of houses to walled gardens and the streets, everything was washed clean and anointed by the cool golden light of autumn. Alone, Song Su became conscious of his own healthy, vigorous body, sharply dressed in a charcoal suit that was made precisely for this weather and delivered to his house by his tailor only the previous week. His tie and the starch collar to which it was pinned the silk-backed waistcoat, the brimmed wool hat, and the polished shoes, everything was delightful. The streets of Jongno were particularly beautiful too, and where he'd only have noticed the peasants and laborers during the summer without any beauty and unpleasant in the extreme, he now saw that the trees aflame with foliage were casting watery shadows over the avenue. His mood stayed bright as he reached his office and settled into his work. First, his secretary, a young man from the country, 
eager to prove himself, but with an oily brown face and mannerisms that were too rustic to make him a man of letters, brought a stack of the morning's newspapers and deferentially laid them across his desk. Song Su skimmed them, starting with the important news in order to feel that he did the right thing, but losing interest and moving on before reaching the conclusion. There was an editorial piece on the second page about the riot that had broken out due to the skyrocketing price of rice, rice which had gone from 15 won per 80 kilograms in January of the previous year to 38 won this August. After dutifully gathering the main points from the editorial, Song Su moved on to a novel that was being serialized and read it with a great deal more interest. The protagonist of the story was an upper class, modern educated man in his 30s, just like Song Su and the author himself. At this point, the protagonist was in the middle of falling in love with his late best friend's widow, despite numerous complications owing to their other loyalties. Though Sang Su, though Sang Su laid down the newspaper muttering, what garbage, disgusting rubbish, he secretly was engrossed in the story, could not help anticipating the next installment, and longed to write something in a similar style. <laughs> And I just, I enjoy that because um, Song Su is just such a ridiculous publishing literary man. And he, um, he's clearly so full of himself and he's disparaging like these other books, but he also secretly envies them. And he's wondering like, how can I write something like that? <laughs> Which I think we all do. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I really liked him too, because I felt like I recognize, I know people like Song Su. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I know, I, I definitely know a lot of people like Song Su, and he, he was such a fun character to write um, because uh, I enjoy um, imbuing these kind of negative characters with my own traits and <laughs> making fun of them, and I think it just makes them more well-rounded. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> well, that's actually great because that leads us into one of the audience Q&As. Um, the first one, which says, what is the easiest and hardest character to write in the book? Oh my God, the hardest was Jade. Mm. And, um, you know, somewhere in a, in a review, somebody, somebody compared me, the author, to Jade, the protagonist. And I'm like, okay, you know, there's a lot of things that I have to say about that. But one is that I'm not her. Um, I think she certainly has aspects of me, but um, she's not even the character that I most identify with. Um, mm -hmm. To be honest, the character that I most closely resemble is probably Myungbo, mm -hmm. who is this idealistic, um, revolutionary, uh, well-educated, always altruistic. I think altruism is his main quality. And I was always like that. You, you know, even when I was little, I wanted to just help. And so, sorry, that's my cat. So um, I would say hardest was Jade. And sh she was also the most important to get down because she's like the center of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the easiest uh, was Song Su. <laughs> I just, I must have met a lot of people like that in publishing. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, okay, this next one says, do either of you have opinions about why Korean culture is so popular in the U.S. right now? I've seen Kim's Convenience, Parasite, Train to Busan, and now I'm seeing many translated books too. I don't know much about K-pop. I might be too old, LOL. <laughs> LOL. Yeah. Um, I have thoughts on this. Carolyn, do you want to answer too? Uh, why don't you start? So, um, so uh, this was definitely not the case when I was growing up here in the 90s in Portland. Um, Korean culture was not well known at all. Um, however, we are certainly having some sort of a great cresting moment in history. And I think it's because um, the Koreans have really, uh, in terms of literature or movies or any type of storytelling, we have figured out uh, a formula that works. And um, you can kind of feel the beat of the story if it's Korean style of storytelling. And Squid Game is actually a great example. It's, mm -hmm. it's all about compelling, co create compelling characters, flawed, but compelling. So you empathize mm -hmm. with them, throw them into all sorts of situations, maybe stop um, intermittently at, at cliffhangers. So you have to find out what happens to them and also give an emotionally satisfying ending. This is, this is kind of the arc of the Korean style of storytelling. And you're like, well, that's obvious. Isn't every story like that? But it really is not. Um, 
it, it's not. And so I think um, they figured out this rhythm that really um, makes people relate. Uh, it's very relatable. Um, but uh, Caroline, what are, what are your thoughts on this? I, I would really, I, I totally agree with you there. Um, I think Koreans are just really good storytellers. <laughs> Um, but, and I think that's the, it translates so well because Koreans are not afraid to be emotional. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, sometimes in Western literature, maybe especially now, there's a, you know, you, there's kind of like a dis, there's a distance and you want to be like super ironic. There's a lot of like maybe really dry kind of humor, which all of which I love too, but I also like really want to get emotionally involved in a story too. And when I was probably about 20 years ago, when I was really trying to learn as much as I could about Korea and Korean culture and stories, I started watching K-dramas and I kind of just did a lot of research to see where, where it was most popular. And it was popular in like the Middle East and in South, South America. And I was really like kind of struck by it, but I think it's because the stories translate really well. It's you know, the emotions between parent and child, those are real, everyone can understand those. And I think Koreans too, they're not afraid of being sentimental, you know, sometimes and that's okay too. I think you're you're really putting the finger right on there. And I think the, that's probably why you say that this, is, this feels very Korean because I'm not hiding behind any sense of irony here. You're really gonna get it. This is about love, war, and redemption, man. I mean, forgiveness, the betrayal, it all happens. And I'm taking it all very seriously. Um, I mean, yeah, that's why I was hooked. You hooked me just like the K dramas do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, okay. Here's a question Did you model any of the characters after yourself or people you know? Oh, uh, yeah, for <laughs> sure. So I would say even the worst characters like Ito. Oh, Ito got a lot of me. Um, Ito has a lot of me, uh, little pieces of my soul in him. And you're thinking that's just absolutely terrible because he, you know he's um, he's a violent, violent man. But that's why um, I think he also feels real. At least to me, he feels like a fully realized human being um, because he has these thoughts that I sometimes have, and uh, um, and you know a lot of the characters. Um, have uh, traits of, of people that I observe around me. Um, not saying that anybody's like a direct translation, but you know, um, how people react in breakup situations, you know, that, that all came out of real life, you know, and that's what makes it feel, um, feel relatable. Just because people are living a hundred years ago doesn't mean that they're not going through heartbreak or like the flutter of their first infatuation. These things happened time immemorial, immemorial. So, um, so yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's all real. <laughs> well, I love that you mentioned Ito because he actually has some of the best lines. I mean, one of the, what he says towards the end, his advice, don't trust anyone, don't suffer unnecessarily, see the truth behind what people say, always find a way to survive. I feel like my mom gave me that same advice when I was a kid. And, you know, I love that you gave that to him and not to another character because it really the villains they're still there they're still people they're still human beings you know and yeah, he's pretty horrible but still there's this part of him that's you know wants to be helpful that's there that's the part of Jue <laughs> as you can see <laughs> the really really terrible villain but also saying some really deep, deep <laughs> helpful things I love that I love that um I just want to end by asking if you have any advice to um, to young writers, beginning writers, or to Korean American writers? Uh, yes, I do. And um, I say there's it's just one sentence. Um, develop your quality and develop your purpose. So, um, or, or your mission. So develop your quality and develop your mission. So your quality is how you write, um, your excellence, your style, your signature, um, you know, it, it's your voice. And then your mission is why, why are you writing? 
you have to have a why. Otherwise, I, if you don't have a why, I don't think you should go into this profession because it can be very traumatizing. Mm -hmm. um, and I faced a lot of rejection in my writing career and I, I will continue to do so. Um, I don't, I'm not arrogant enough to think this is all gonna be a smooth road. Um, that's very dishonest. Mm -hmm. But um, if you can figure out a how and a why, then you can go through any hurdles. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's really great advice. You know, I really felt that I reading your novel, um, I just felt that at the beginning of each chapter, there was like a goal, you know, for each chapter. And it really, really helped with the momentum and the pacing. Like I never felt like, I have to admit, a lot of novels, I always feel like there are these parts that just kind of sag, and you just like kind of plug your way through them. But um, there's no really no sense of meandering in this novel and it didn't feel repetitive. It had this really wonderful momentum going through. So yeah, I could see that. Thank you. Uh, well, congratulations. This is, this is a wonderful novel. I'm so glad to, that there's a, this book exists now and is about takes place in Korea and is in English. It was really exciting for me to read and thank you for asking me to be here. Thank you for being such a wonderful conversation partner. <laughs> all right thank you both for joining us um, oh it's so exciting i just love it when like debut authors come and it's their special like it's their first like first or second event it's their like, birthday and they're from portland it's just, like it's just really nice it's always more a little special um i'm gonna share the links to the book uh so that way you all can make sure you grab your copies if you have not or if you want to grab additional copies i'm pretty sure that would be also really wonderful um, give me one second. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you have any um, more upcoming events? Either this, like, I was going to say today, and I was like, you can't do three events in one day, but this week. I know. I think you do, Juhei. Don't you have oh, some? Yeah, it we have oh, it was a question. Oh, so sorry. Um, no, you're good. Yes, uh, I have Ellie at Bay tomorrow. Um, for those of us who are in Seattle, um, Solid State Books with Yun Choi um, on Thursday. And um, I have Madison Street Books in Chicago next Tuesday with Nicole Chung and um, Ooh, Odyssey, Nicole Chung. Bookshop, Odyssey Bookshop Thursday in Massachusetts with Naomi Krupiski, whose book was recently a New York Times bestseller and a Jenna's Book Club pick. Oh, so, nice. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> so many interesting people. I, I know Nicole Chung and I love Nicole Chung. So this makes me even happier. Go Nicole Chung. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, I want to thank you two for joining us. This is so wonderful. Everyone, make sure to buy this book. Like I said, I dropped a link in the um, chat. All the books will come signed. And make sure to check out other events because, you know, there's this, what else is it to do with the evening to support some local debut authors? But everyone, have a really good night. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.